spent a lot of time reading Carl Jung, and it was through Jung and also Jean Piaget, who's a developmental psychologist, that I started to understand that our articulated systems of thought are embedded in something like a dream, <clears throat> and that that dream is informed in a complex way by the way we act. So, you know, we act out things we don't understand all the time, and if that wasn't the case, then we wouldn't need a psychology or a sociology or an anthropology or any of that, because we would be completely transparent to ourselves. And we're clearly not. So we're much more complicated than we understand, which means that the way that we behave contains way more information than we know. And part of the dream that surrounds our articulated knowledge has been extracted as a consequence of us watching each other behave and telling stories about it for thousands and thousands and thousands of years, extracting out patterns of behavior that characterize humanity and trying to represent them partly through imitation but also through drama and mythology and literature and art and all of that to represent what we're like so that we can understand what we're like. And I see in it the struggle of humanity to arise, to rise above its animal forebears, say, and to become conscious of what it means to be human. And that's a very difficult thing because we don't know who we are, what we are, where we came from, or any of those things. And, you know, the light life is an unbroken chain going back three and a half billion years. It's an absolutely unbelievable thing. Every single one of your ancestors reproduced successfully for three and a half billion years. It's absolutely unbelievable. And we rose out of the dirt and the muck, and here we are, conscious but not knowing, and we're trying to figure out who we are. Freud, I suppose, in some sense, started to collate, collate the information that we had pertaining to the notion that people lived inside a dream. You know, it was Freud who really popularized the idea of the unconscious mind. And, and we, we take this for granted to such a degree today that we don't understand how revolutionary the idea was. Like, with what's happened with Freud is that we've taken all the marrow out of his bones, so to speak, and left the husk behind. And, you know, now when we think about Freud, we just think about the husk because... 
That's everything that's been discarded, but so much of what he discovered is part of our popular conception now, including the idea that your perceptions and your actions and your thoughts are all, um, what would you say, informed and, and shaped by unconscious motivations that are not part of your voluntary control. And that's a very, very strange thing. It's one of the most unsettling things about the psychoanalytic theories, because the psychoanalytic theories are something like, you're a loose collection of living sub-personalities, each with its own set of motivations and perceptions and emotions and rationales, all of that. And you have limited control over that, so you're like a plurality of, 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 of internal personalities that's loosely linked into a unity. You know that because you can't control yourself very well, which is one of Jung's objections to Nietzsche's idea that we could create our own values. So Jung didn't believe that, especially not after interacting with Freud, because he saw that human beings were affected by things that were deeply, deeply affected by things that were beyond their conscious control. And no one really knows how to conceptualize those things. You know, the cognitive psychologists think about them in some sense as computational machines. And the ancient people, I think, thought of them as gods, although it's more complex than that. Like rage would be a god. Mars, the god of rage, that's the thing that possesses you when you're angry. You know, it has a viewpoint and it, 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 it says what it wants to say. And that might have very little to do with what you want to say when you're being sensible. And it doesn't just inhabit you, it inhabits everyone, and it lives forever, and it even inhabits animals. And so it's this transcendent psychological entity that inhabits the, the body, politic, like, like a thought inhabits the brain. That's one way of thinking about it. It's a very strange way of thinking, but it certainly, it certainly has its merits. And so, and those things, well, in some sense, those are deities, although it's not that simple. And so Jung, Jung was got very interested in dreams and started to understand the relationship between dreams and myths because he would see in his clients' dreams echoes of stories that he knew because he was deeply read in mythology. And, and then he started to believe that the dream was the birthplace of the myth and that there was a continual interaction between the two processes, the dream and the story, and storytelling. And, well, you know, you tend to tell your dreams as stories when you remember them. And some people remember dreams all the time like two or three a night, I've had clients like that, and they often have archetypal dreams that have very clear mythological structures. I think that's more the case with people who are creative, by the way, especially if they're a bit unstable at, at the time, because the dream tends to occupy the space of uncertainty and to concentrate on fleshing out the, the unknown reality before you get a real grip on it. So it's like the dream is the birthplace of thinking. That's a good way of thinking about it. And so because it's the birthplace of thinking, it's not that clear it's doing its best to formulate something. That was Jung's notion, as opposed to Freud, who believed that there were sensors, internal sensors, that were hiding the dream's true message. That's not what Jung believed. He believed the dream was doing its best to, ex to express a reality that was still outside of fully articulated conscious comprehension. It was, because you think, look, a thought appears in your head, right? That's obvious. P bang, it's, it, it's nothing you ever ask about. But what the hell does that mean? A thought appears in your head. What kind of ridiculous explanation is that? You know, it's, it just doesn't help with anything. Where does it come from? Well, nowhere. It just appears in my head. Okay, well, that's not a very sophisticated explanation, as it turns out, you know? And so you might think that those thoughts, thoughts that you think, well, where do they come from? Well, they're often someone else's thoughts, right? Someone long dead, that might be part of it, just like the words you use to think are utterances of people who've been long dead. And so you're informed by the spirit of your ancestors. That's one way of looking at it. And your motivations speak to you, and your emotions speak to you, and your body speaks to you. And it all does all that, at least in part, through the dream. And the dream is the birthplace of the fully articulated idea. Anyways, back to Jung. Jung was a great believer in the dream, and I noted that dreams will tell you things that you don't know. And then I thought, well, how the hell can that be? How the, in the world can something you think up tell you something you don't know? How, how does that make any sense? First of all, why don't you understand it? Why does it have to come forth in the form of the dream? It's like you're not, there's something going on inside you that you don't control, right? The dream happens to you just like life happens to you. I mean, there is the odd lucid dreamer who can you know, apply a certain amount of conscious control, but most of the time it's 
you're laying there asleep and this crazy complicated world manifests itself inside you and you don't know how, you, could, you can't do it when you're awake and you don't know what it means. It's like, what the hell's going on? And that's one of the things that's so damn frightening about the psychoanalysts because you get this both from Freud and Jung, you really start to understand that there are things inside you that are happening that control you instead of the other way around. You know, there's a bit of reciprocal control, but there's manifestations of spirits, so to speak, inside you that determine the manner in which you walk through life. And you don't control it. And what does? Is it random? You know, there are people who have claimed that dreams are mere, merely the consequence of random neuronal firing, which is a theory I think is absolutely absurd because there's nothing random about dreams. You know, they're very, very structured and, and very, very complex. And they're not like snow on a television screen or, or static on a radio. Like, those things are complicated. And, and then also I've seen so often that people have very coherent dreams that have a perfect narrative structure. You know, they're fully developed in some sense. And so that just doesn't, I, that theory just doesn't go anywhere with me. I just can't see that as useful at all. And... So, so I'm more likely to take the phenomena seriously and say, well, there's something to dreams. Well, you dream of the future and then you try to make it into a reality. That seems to be an important thing. You know, or maybe you dream up a nightmare and try to make that into a reality because people do that too if they're hell-bent on revenge, for example, and full of hatred and resentment. I mean, that manifests itself in terrible fantasies. You know, those are dreams, then people go act them out. These things are powerful. You know, and whole nations can get caught up in collective dreams. That's what happened to the Nazis. That's what happened to Nazi Germany in the 1930s. It was an absolutely remarkable, amazing, horrific, destructive spectacle. And the same thing happened in the Soviet Union. The same thing happened in China. It's like, we have to take these things seriously, you know, and try to understand what's going on.